It's our pleasure today to have Lou Cabine, wonderful artist in multimedia, is joining us today, and she's part of our upcoming exhibition titled Essential that features work by 13 different artists. It's a, a big show and a wide variety of work. Uh, but Lou, um, thank you so much for joining us today. And if you could share your background and interests and um, dive in, that would be great. Okay, thank you. And thanks very much, Deborah. I'm very glad to be doing this. It's a wonderful opportunity. Thanks for the invitation. And also I'm very happy to be um, showing at um, BAC in this upcoming um, exhibition. Um, I also will say that I am sitting here in my home studio in Seattle, which is of course on um, unceded territory of the Duwamish. I'll start by giving credit to my high school art teacher, um, Elizabeth Stein back in uh, central Illinois, Bloomington, Illinois. She was from Chicago. Um, and I and my parents who are musicians, who were musicians, professional musicians, um, we were all the product of free education in the arts thanks to the public school system. So I uh, really appreciate the work that the gallery does in terms of your supporting of um, school, school art programs. Um, so Ms. Stein, um, I studied with her for three years and I use some of those skills daily uh, in my studio practice still decades and decades and decades later, mostly through my drawing practice. Um, I do have a, a BA, again, public university um, in drawing and painting. And when I was um, an undergraduate, this was, um, I graduated from the University of Maryland in College Park near Washington, DC. Um, as an undergraduate, I took all of my electives, well, all but one, I did take one poetry class. Um, I took all of my electives in the crafts. Um, partly that was a pragmatic choice or it started out as a pragmatic choice. Back in the day, you could get a pretty good uh, day jobs teaching art classes for the recreation department or continuing ed. And uh, there were a lot of folks teaching painting, um, but there, were, there was always um, a call for folks uh, teaching in the crafts. And so I immersed myself in whatever craft classes were available, found out that I really loved to make things. I didn't see a lot of separation inside myself between my uh, drawing and my painting classes and my uh, classes in the crafts, silversmithing, ceramics. And weaving was the last of the craft classes for me to take. I had to be a senior. I had to have some literal seniority to get into that class because I wasn't one of the majors who required it. I wasn't in one of the majors that required it. And so I really was kind of dragging my feet, but I'm a very thorough person. And this was a system I'd set up for myself. And so I took the weaving class and slowly but surely with every assignment, I was completely seduced into really being passionate about textiles. And so when I graduated, um, and set up my painting studio so I could make a portfolio to go to grad school. Um, I also had a loom, a, a floor loom that I had purchased in order to do the advanced classes in weaving that were offered. And uh, that was down near in the kitchen. And I made one pretty decent, I will have to say pretty decent pastel drawing in my painting, my painting studio. And the rest of the time I was at my loom. So the die was cast there in certain ways. I, I was living in the Maryland, on the Maryland side of Washington DC and had uh, and did land some of those teaching jobs um, with the recreation department and came to meet a lot of um, collectors of Americana and became completely uh, seduced once again uh, into I would say in hindsight, apprenticing myself to 
my my chose to to my craft of of hand weaving by really doing deep dives into historic or um, colonial American crafts. And I did a lot of reproduction hand weaving of uh, colonial crafts and landed a job as an independent contractor for the Smithsonian doing their um, demonstrations for the public as well as some uh, teacher and docent training, which was also my introduction to textile history besides the technical you know, um, record. Um, and that was another love. And that has been a, a through line of my life. So I'm quite passionate about textiles in general, started out as a hand weaver, and I'm very passionate about textile history. Um, yeah, I did, through that apprenticeship, I did, I did really focus. I had a kind of anti-art reaction. I think a lot of women in the 70s and 80s did so. Um, you weren't really a boy. You weren't really ever gonna be able to sit in the cedar bar in the same way as your teachers kind of expected a good artist to do so. And uh, textiles, weaving especially, but textiles in general offered me a way to make art about something I knew. And um, I, I was basically William, I tried to make myself William Morris in the countryside, you know, saving the world through well-designed placemats was, it was a lofty ambition. I am not without, you know, a certain amount of idealism. And I did make some pretty fine placemats, I will have to say. Um, but uh, that sort of isolated um, idealism did kind of uh, run its course. And I did find myself back um, really longing to basically make art as a shorthand. So that was a long um, process. But I, by that time, I was living um, in Illinois, just outside of Chicago. And I did get my MFA in fibers at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, and then taught there both, um, both the studio classes and fibers, contemporary fibers, as well as textile history for the art history department. Um, yeah, and then I woke up one morning over 40 with two children and no health insurance. And um, with all due respect um, and affection, for my gallery dealers in Chicago and my colleagues um, in the, the adjunct teaching core of the School of the Art Institute, SAIC, School of the Art Institute of Chicago, um, I just really needed a real job. <laughs> and so I um, started to put my hat in the ring and um, to, to my um, great, um, delight and gratitude, I was hired here at the University of Washington in Seattle um, last century in 1993, where I taught in the fibers department, both textile history and studio and ended up as chair of the interdisciplinary uh, program in the studio division of the School of Art of the University of Washington, Seattle. So that's a, that's a little encapsulation if um, that gives you a place to start. And then you retired a few years ago from that position? Is that I right? did, I did. I retired <laughs> from uh, teaching. Um, I'm in the studio full time. I will have to say that um, a big part of the appeal to me in the application process was that uh, the, U, the UW here in Seattle is a research institution. And so much as I love my teaching, my teaching load was relatively lighter than that of my colleagues at other institutions. But that, and that was huge to me because the studio is basically um, my life. And um, if I'm not in the studio, I, feel, I felt myself to be a fraud in the classroom, if I was not doing my own work. Um, 
And so, yes, so thanks. Uh, yes, I did step down from teaching. I retired from teaching in 2015. It's a little bit of a blur. Um, and I, I'm in the studio now. Actually, the way I put it is that um, now I'm in the studio all the time and I can have a life. We always divide up our lives into these separate little compartments and yes. take yeah. care of these different aspects. But it's wonderful to see the, the work you've done. Over <laughs> the I, I see some behind you and, um, and the variety of techniques and influences that come into your work are really quite impressive and engaging. Oh. Um, your interest in science and climate change and um, history and all, all the so many areas that you've gone into. Um, it it seems your recent focus is really um, on climate and environment, and you've even partnered with scientists at points. Can you speak to that? Yes, um, sure. Yes, uh, most recently, and actually. Um, during the lockdown, although obviously that wasn't planned, but I, to my unending gratitude, I was embarked on a project that teamed artists with scientists. And I, I was into my process that way when the lockdown happened and so had a kind of structuring device for my creative life, you know, throughout all of our shared um, upheaval of the last 15, 18 months. So the name of that project is Science Stories. Mm. And it was, it was, is uh, sponsored by the University of Puget Sounds, uh, Collins Library, the, the UPS's Slater Museum of Natural History. Mm. Those two aspects of the university plus um, an artist curator. So there are three curators and they teamed up, um, invited artists with scientists to um, create artist books. So that was, those were the parameters. And the artists, I was um, very pleased to be invited. The artists were given the option of, of course, working with one of these wonderful um, scientists who had volunteered to share their research with an artist uh, and then kind of step back, you know, to see what might emerge. Uh, so brave, brave hearts, brave souls. Um, but the artists were given the option of, of doing that, teaming up with one of the scientists who volunteered or choosing an object from the Slater Museum to work with and draw inspiration from and create a work around or find one one's own scientist <laughs> so um again mar marvelous scientists who uh, volunteered for this project and i greatly enjoyed getting to know about their research but i um they were i i found myself uh drawn to literally drawn to working in the herbarium of the Slater Museum. As you can see, these are, these are samples that I use for my own drawings here. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very interested in the botanical record as evidenced by herbarium. So places where dried, dried botanical specimens with very specific uh, scientific labeling um, codes, essentially, are housed. Um, and consulted. So just as I started to work down in Tacoma in the herbarium, the lock the lockdown happened. And so that was um, not available to me. And so I stayed here up here in Seattle with my own um, beloved wild place called the Union Bay Natural Area and produced an artist book based on uh, my getting to know that, that natural area. And um, about halfway through my process, again, because of lockdown and the difficulty of, of connecting with people, um, 
worked with the scientist um, Karen Crandall, who is a um, restoration ecologist mm -hmm. who teaches or in ordinary times would have been teaching at the Union Bay. Um, and so, so we, we conversed a lot and I learned a lot about um, um, restoration and its philosophy and things like that. Well, it's wonderful. It's it seems like a really extensive look at the natural world around you, kind of meditation on what the world once was and what the world is and what it could be, perhaps. So yes, actually, that's re that's really um, that's quite astute, Deborah, because that is that's pretty much a summation of my thoughts and then that's what I found and it's hard to say right now because the work is still fairly new um I mean the work that I made is still fairly new to me but um the Union Bay natural area is actually a restored landscape that never existed so this natural area was underwater it was under Lake Washington hmm. It was exposed as mud flats when they built the ship canal and became a landfill. So it was lake and then landfill for 40 years and then capped with rubble and in the 70s and allowed to, with the thought that, you know, we'll just leave nature alone. And of course it became Blackberry. And so, um, you know, the restoration, restoration um, began uh, with the hiring of a professor, um, I'm sure quite a young Turk at the time. That's my assumption. I don't know that for a fact, um, but uh, somebody on the cutting edge of this whole new, and you know, this, this endeavor of uh, restore, actively restoring uh, decayed or, or damaged landscapes. So it's a marvelous place to be now. It's full of wildlife, both, both botanicals as well as uh, creatures. And uh, right in the middle of the city. Have there been studies of wildlife being attracted to this, this spot now and um, comparing with before? And Yes, and that, I mean, there are assessments done, you know, the university, and the, so the university uses this space as a lab mm. for restoration um, techniques. And so there are assessments. Um, as a, as a non-scientist, they're a little dense for me. And so actually Karen and I have ongoing conversations where I get a little translation sometimes, right, of, of those things but then um and then it had again pre pre-lockdown it was used students were taught techniques of restoration by planting etc cetera, etc cetera. and um controlling invasives is really it's, it seems to me is the primary role of humans in an ongoing way in this environment um, and so controlling the invasives with as, uh, with as few chemicals as possible, right? So there have been, and my, and my, piece, my, my piece that um, is going to be shown at the Collins soon and is, is available on a, a website, which I can send the link to you if, um, and we could make it available, you know, through some, some kind of text or typing thing here mm -hmm. later. Um, it's it's all in there yeah and lots of other artists there are maybe 20 artists who worked with scientists um during the lockdown literally in your own backyard it sounds like you were able to explore what was in your neighborhood and yes use. <laughs> exactly and and that's also a big part of the sh of the work that will be there at um at the gallery um, the herbarium of useful plants, and that that effort really started with my research, my my sort of shared research project with another artist, Sarah Jones, um, 
and we did a, a deep dive into reading essentially about climate change and the Anthropocene and specifically the botanical evidence because I'm an artist who likes to draw plants and um, as, is, as is Sarah um, and in addition, she is a horticulturist and a garden designer. So we did this deep dive via the botany into um, climate change and that that uh, collaboration culminated in a joint residency at the Bloedel. Well, I think it's really interesting. Um, one of the other pieces you have in the exhibition with us speaks to the fact that certain words are being removed from the dictionary, mm -hmm. considered not important for children of a certain age range to learn. Yeah. Words yeah. like acorn, why wouldn't acorns be important for a child to learn. It just, it so powerfully speaks to exactly what you're discussing now, just our connection to the natural world. Yeah, well, thank you for, uh, I just realized now as we're talking that the, the two pieces that you guys have chosen to show, like like the, the herbarium of useful plants is kind of like a grown up version of engagement, right? So instead, so do the botany, you know, pick the plant and press it and make it beautiful on a page. And then instead of the really rather intimidating scientific labeling method um, that has come down to us. Um, you know, label it in your own way with a story or with a recipe with your own story. So the grown up version and then the, the, the child version of, or the thing that got me motivated to make an artwork was to learn, as you say, Deborah, um, that the Oxford Junior Dictionary has started to um, eliminate words having to do with the countryside um, with the, uh, and the justification for that choice of editing is that these words are not, are not relevant to the lives of children under the age of 10. And it was that relevant, you know, word that really struck me. And I feel the same way you do. I mean, acorn, fern, brook, um, the names of many trees, the names of, veg of certain vegetables, the names of, of creatures. And so I made the flashcards. Uh, letterpress printed. Um, yes, I, in addition to loving to stitch and draw um, and research, um, I do really love to set type. <laughs> it feels to me like just the, it, I get the same sense of pleasure um, that I get when I when I stitch when I embroider. So yeah, so they're they're letterpress printed flashcards. To, and I pulled the words from this list. Um, I was able to suss out, because this is all happening in the UK, right? It's that Oxford, right? Um, I, think that, I think I was able to find a list of maybe 150 words having to do with the, with the British landscape. Um, most of them having to do with nature, but not all. And so I, I pulled from those, that list, the words that were particularly relevant, I, I felt to us here in the Pacific Northwest. Well, we can't wait to have your works on display in the gallery and to feel the power of them in person and um, with all their textures and layers of meaning and thought. <laughs> um, and it, it's just really wonderful to hear you speak about your process and all that goes into it. Thank you so much for taking the time to oh, talk to us today. My pleasure. Thank you. Be sure not to miss Essential, an exhibition centered around food, farms, and art with works by regional artists at Bainbridge Arts and Crafts from September 3rd through September 26th.